So I'm Monique Tan, and on behalf of the SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar on enzymes and extracting biological insight using Uniprot. And today with us are Elisabeth Gasteiger, Jürgen Bollemann, and Marie-Claude Blatter. They are all working on Uniprot Swissprot in Geneva. Okay, hello and welcome to this first part of today's webinar. My name is Elisabeth Gasteiger and today we want to explore together what is needed to make meaning, meaningful queries into Uniprot, uh, especially in the context of enzymes. We will provide the presentation in PDF format to you afterwards, so uh, you will get a version of all the slides and all the links in there should be clickable. The outline for today is that first we'll provide a concise in introduction to enzymes and to the Uniprot knowledge base. Following that, we'll take a closer look at how enzymes are annotated within Uniprot KB. And then we'll explore the difference between the two sections of Uniprot KB, the reviewed Swissprot and the unreviewed Tremble, in terms of content and information sources. And I will give you some important background to help you understand how to query and how to interpret your query results. Then we'll direct our focus on the content of Uniprot records pertaining to enzymes and provide a few examples of simple and advanced queries across various biological contexts. And in the last part, my colleague Jervin Bollemann will take over to show how to use the Sparkle query language. Enzymes are involved in almost every biochemical process that occurs in living cell, in living cells, and as expected from there, their genes constitute a large fraction of most genomes and therefore also of databases. The main focus today is what types of enzyme-related information can be found in the Uniprot knowledge base and how can users retrieve this information. The Uniprot website, we've put the URL up there for you gives access to several databases. Today, we're going to focus on the Uniprot knowledge base, Uniprot KB, and you will notice that I will often just say Uniprot um, for simplification in what follows. Main funding for Uniprot comes from the NIH in the United States, the EMBL EBI, and the Swiss government. What is Uniprot? It is a public, uh, Uniprot KB, sorry, is a public database which provides a comprehensive, high quality and freely accessible set of protein sequences associated with biological information, including, of course, enzyme information. As of the current release, there are about 250 million protein records from over a million different species and uh, about 40 million species, uh, 40 million of these records are enzymes. Uniprot is collaboratively maintained by a group at the SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, by the EBI, European Bioinformatics Institute, and PIR in the United States a Protein Information Resource. You can find here a link to our latest uh, publication. This will be a very brief overview here of the content of a Uniprot KB record. We just want to introduce a few basic concepts in, in a single slide here. Each record has a, u a unique accession number. You can see it at the top right, um, P08631 in this case. Always use the accession numbers when citing Uniprot because they are unique and stable. You can browse through any record on the website by navigating through the section titles listed on the left. What defines the protein record in the first place is the protein sequence itself. Every record contains one protein sequence, but in cases where there are alternative isoforms for the same gene, there can be more than one protein sequence. The sequence shown by default is called the canonical protein sequence and uh, the alternative sequences are usually called isoforms. Complementing the sequence, we have, of course, biological information, for example, in the function section, which is either written in free text or using different controlled vocabularies. An example where a controlled vocabulary is used is the enzymatic reaction, which referred to as catalytic activity. 
And another way of representing biological information is used for important sites that can be associated with a specific position in the protein sequence, such as uh, the example shown here, active sites, binding sites, or post-translational modifications. This type of annotation is often provided using controlled vocabulary, and the vast majority of this biological information refers to positions in the canonical sequence. How can we query UniProtKB? In this webinar, we will show how to search UniProtKB. Most of you are probably already familiar with the simple search box, which you can use a bit like Google. But we will mainly show today how you can build queries using the advanced search option on the right of the query box to open up the, the advanced search menu, where we can choose specific data fields within which we want to search for our terms instead of just doing a full text search. Even more complex queries can be done using a technology called Sparkle, as we'll see towards the, the end of this presentation. We'll use that symbol that you see here whenever we refer to, to Sparkle until we're actually in the particular section about Sparkle. To conduct meaningful queries and to accurately interpret the results, it's important that um, we understand how enzymes are annotated in Uniprot, especially today as we're speaking about enzymes. The differences between the two sections, SwissProt and Tremble for reviewed and unreviewed entries, and the content of a Uniprot record in detail. Uniprot KB uses information from the RIA database uh, for reactions and the KB ontology to allow access to a wealth of information on enzymes. RIA is an expert curated knowledge base of biochemical and transport reactions of biological interest based on experimental data that the curators extract from publications. And this is a typical view of an enzymatic reaction imported from the RIA database into Uniprot. This enzyme, which is present in the coffee Arabica plant, is involved in the synthesis of caffeine. We can click on a reaction participant to find, find out more about it from the KB database. Here we have clicked, and now we see the corresponding record in KB which stands for Chemical Entities of Biological Interest and is an ontology of small chemical compounds. The KEBI record for caffeine provides a lot of information about this molecule. As you can see, there are several tabs at the top. At the top of the main tab, we can find the name of the molecule and its KEBI identifier, both of which we can use to query Uniprot. The Uniprot search engine will also accept the so-called INCHI key, which is a compact and computer-readable representation of the chemical structure. I mentioned that KEBI is an ontology, which means that it categorizes the different molecules and represents relationships between them. An example for such a relationship is the fact that caffeine is a purine alkaloid. These relationships are indexed in Uniprot, which means that you can, for example, query Uniprot using caffeine, but also with its parent term, which is purine alkaloid in this case. If we use the parent, the results will include matches for the parent, but also for all of the nodes below, the children and grandchildren, if we want to tell them and so on. So in summary, we can query Uniprot using small molecule names, KB identifiers, or Inchiki. All three approaches return the same results because they describe the same molecule, which is caffeine here. Autocompletion is provided and suggests all the molecules that match what we have typed, including synonyms if applicable. We can also use the term purine alkaloid which is a parent of caffeine and get all the enzymes involved in purine alkaloid metabolism, including caffeine. The number of results returned by that query is higher as expected. To take this one step further, we could also search for enzymes interacting with small molecules which are similar to caffeine, 
but this is not possible with the text search engine on the website. However, it's a question that can be answered using Spark. In summary, we've now seen the sources that UNI produces for enzyme reactions and small molecules, RIA and KEBI. Reactions are based on RIA, but we also use the so-called EC numbers, which is a numerical classification system at four levels for enzymes based on the chemical reactions they catalyze. This classification is established by a committee called the Enzyme Commission, which uh, meets regularly and decides about um, new enzyme classifications. And as we have seen, small molecules are based on the KEBI database. After this, we're now ready to explore the additional wealth of information found in Uniprot KB for enzymes, but also for proteins in general. Before that, a few words about the concepts of enzymes and protein sequences and their relationships. Not all real reactions and not all EC numbers are linked to a protein sequence in Uniprot. Put the number here. The numbers here 14% of active EC numbers have no link to any protein sequence, and 25% of all real reactions have no link to any protein sequence. This is in part due to the fact that for some enzymes, the mechanism is known, but the participants have not been sequenced or characterized. But in part, it could also be due to a possible backlog in biocuration. As a result, achieving a comprehensive set of enzymes can be challenging, although we are now exploring ways to boost the coverage of enzymes with machine learning approaches. For example, by identifying chemicals from the literature. This shows the typical query required to retrieve all enzymes present in Uniprot using the advanced search query and the Boolean or operator. So we're looking for all Entry for entries that have either an EC number or a catalytic activity described in RIA. This query will come up again and again in this course as we're going to look at subsets of enzymes and add more constraints using AND. It is important to note that the Boolean AND operator has a stronger precedence than OR. And if we want to keep the two conditions for enzymes, RIA or EC number, if we want to keep them together with OR, we will have to surround these two conditions with an extra set of parentheses. The advanced search cannot guess how we want to, to group our constraints, so we'll have to add these parentheses back in manually in the query string every time we have used the advanced search. This is why I've put them in red here to remind us. Here is a question which one of our users asked us at the help desk a few years ago. The first step in answering this question is to use exactly the query shown before, catalytic activity in RIA or EC number, and restrict that to Homo sapiens using the corresponding taxonomy identifier, which is 9606. You don't, know to, you don't have to know that by heart, and I'll say more about these identifiers later. Since the reviewed and expertly curated section SwissProt contains a complete set of genes for human, we can assume that there is in principle one record in SwissProt for every gene. And we can therefore safely restrict our query to SwissProt uh, reviewed, reviewed true. And we get 5,000 records corresponding to roughly 5,000 genes. According to this result, we have about 24% of the human genes coding for, for enzymes. This is what we can obtain from the current version of the database, but the database cannot represent the full complexity of nature, which leads us to the answer that one of our colleagues gave to the user. Here is what Christian Axelsen, who specializes in enzyme biocuration and is also a member of the Enzyme Commission, which assigns the so-called EC numbers, tried to explain. He, he says, we don't, do not know the roles of a substantial number of the human proteins. That's one of the, the problems. Also, some known enzymes are currently missing EC number assignments. The number of enzymes depends on how you count 
enzymatic complexes and how you deal with splice variants with isoforms. All in all, he concludes that uh, there are about 40% of human genes that code for enzymes. Now to comprehend the results of our queries and to make them meaningful, it's also essential to grasp the distinction between the two sections of Uniprot KB, SwissProt and Tremble. Uniprot KB is composed of these two sections, SwissProt, the reviewed and expert curated section, which contains only about 0.23% of the records, and Tremble, the unreviewed section, which contains almost all protein secrets. It is very important to note that although being tiny in numbers, this set of, of expertly curated proteins that we find in SwissProt, SwissProt is extremely crucial for researchers and it's also used to improve the huge amount of unreviewed sequences using automatic annotation and machine learning techniques. Throughout the website, you can find the yellow icon for reviewed entries and the gray icon for unreviewed entries. We recommend that you pay special attention to this to identify reviewed information. Here's an overview of the major differences between these two sections. First, we'll look at the sequences themselves, which are reviewed by our expert curators in SwissProt while they are not reviewed in Tremble. If we say the sequence are, sequences are reviewed or not, the question is where do they come from in the first place? 99% of the protein sequences in Uniprot are de derived from the translation of nucleotide sequences, mRNA or DNA, essentially from Embel Gen Bank, TDBJ or Ensemble. Here is a SwissProt record and um, the protein sequence shown here has been constructed by the expert biocurators based on the translation of several relevant nucleotide sequences, either RNA or DNA, which are not necessarily identical. The protein sequence that is eventually shown in the entry is also mapped to the official human genome sequence. In the case of human, um, for other species similar if a genome is available. In Tremble, however, the protein sequence corresponds to the automatic translation of a single nucleotide sequence and has not been reviewed by a curator. The information about the origin of sequences may now prompt us to ask questions of this nature. Find all Drosophila enzymes whose protein sequence has been derived from the translation of at least two mRNA sequences. This can be answered with Sparkle. The next difference we're looking at between SwissProt and Tremble concerns the concept of sequence redundancy. In SwissProt, one record corresponds to one gene in principle. In Tremble, however, each protein sequence is one protein record, and there can be many Tremble records for the same gene. As illustrated in this example, where we have queried Uniprot for the gene LCT, a gene coding for the enzyme lactase. It's the one that allows those of us who are not lactose intolerant to digest the main sugar in milk. What we obtain is four records in human, one in SwissProt with a protein sequence of 1927 amino acids and three records in Tremble with proteins of different lengths, which may represent fragments or alternative isoforms or gene predictions of lower quality. We can assume that the correct protein sequence is the one from SwissProt, since it has been carefully reviewed by a curator, including validation against mammalian orthologs. Next, we will look at how SwissProt and Tremble differ regarding the biological information associated with the protein sequence. In SwissProt, biological information is extracted from the literature by expert curators, but can also be propagated by similarity from orthologous species or predicted by computational methods, which the curators then validate. In Tremble, however, if biological information is provided, which is often not the case, 
It comes from completely automated systems without undergoing review by biocurators. The source of an annotation can be seen when clicking on these labels, which we also call evidence tags. And behind these textual labels that show the source of any biological information on the website, we use a set of codes from the evidence and conclusion ontology echo, which allows to make very specific queries into the source and thus potentially the trustworthiness of an annotation. Now, finally, let's delve deeper into the content of a Uniprod record, looking in particular for information relevant to enzymes. We had already briefly seen this navigation panel, which structures every record on the Uniprod website and where you can click on the section name to jump directly to the relevant information within the record. Starting with protein and gene names, in SwissProt, protein names and gene names are validated by the expert curators and all names ever mentioned in the literature are included so that everyone can find the protein easily. In Tremble, protein and gene names are very heterogeneous because first names can be directly imported from nucleotide sequence databases such as BINA, where names are assigned by the individual submitters, which are now more and more often genome sequencing consortia who do not always put a lot of effort into assigning gene and product names. Second, protein names can also come from automated annotation procedures, for example, um, one called Google Prot NLM, a model trained to predict the protein name from the protein's amino acid sequence. This is done in cases where no other names are available. It is therefore a good idea if uh, there is a gene nomenclature committee available for the organism you're working with to query your favorite enzymes with their gene names instead of protein names. That query that we have seen previously, where we were looking for the human gene LCT, nicely illustrates this diversity of protein names that can be encountered based on the different annotation methods and data sources in SwissProt and Tremble. The first one is the SwissProt entry, where there's um, a number of names available. And um, in the Tremble entries, uh, sometimes you can see the, that the protein name is the same as the gene name. Now we're looking at taxonomic data, which is curated by experts in collaboration with the NCBI taxonomy team. We strongly recommend to always use the taxonomic identifier, which is a, use, a unique identifier for the source organism or group of organisms. By the way, you do not have to know these identifiers, of course. When you use the advanced search on our website, there is an auto-completion and suggestion mechanism that will build queries with tax IDs based on what you've typed. An example that illustrates the importance of this is Drosophila, which can be a fruit fly, as most people know and expect with um, this taxonomy ID here, or a type of fungus with a completely different taxonomy ID. The term human is also found in the names of many human viruses or parasites, for example, the human immunodeficiency virus. So it is really important to use the tax ID instead. The word bacteria is another example for a word that occurs in many organism names. And um, we'll do a query now where we will see that in the advanced search you start typing bacteria and you see a variety of, uh, of suggestions. We're asking the question, can we find dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter in bacteria? This is a result, seven entries, that may seem surprising at first because dopamine is a neurotransmitter that acts on areas of our brain to give us feelings of pleasure, satisfaction and motivation. And we might not immediately expect bacterial entries for this molecule. Now to find out more, uh, we'll have a closer look at at least one of these seven records, six of which are in SwissProt and one in Tremble. And they're all related to bacterial enzymes involved in the metabolism of dopamine. We click on the second one. 
to a reviewed protein from an intestinal bacteria called Enterococcus faecalis. We find that this bacterial enzyme is implicated in the metabolism of L-DOPA, which is a drug used to treat Parkinson's disease. And interestingly, this bacterial enzyme contributes to the variability of drug response in different individuals. In the catalytic activity subsection, the reaction imported from RIA is displayed for more details. There are more reactions, and the second one is the one with the function we just saw. The same Swiss prod record also showcases supplementary information about various properties, including cofactors, activity regulation, and kinetics, as well as the position of the active site, which is a tyrosine here, and binding sites in the protein sequence. These types of sequence related information can be visualized on the 3D structure using the feature viewer tool. You can click on the link to the feature viewer and choose a 3D structure from PDB or AlphaFold and visualize the various sequence annotations on it. Here, the tyrosine at position 420, which is the active site, is depicted in green in the structure. About 560 different subcellular locations are described in Uniprot. These locations are described using controlled vocabularies and can be found in the section subcellular location with a corresponding illustration coming from the Swiss Biopics database. This is a plant enzyme and therefore the image of a plant cell is selected to show the protein is located in the cell membrane. It is a transmembrane protein with seven predicted transmembrane do domains, as we can see. Here's another question which we might ask, and that could be answered with Sparkle. Find enzymes which contain at least two transmembrane domains whose 3D struct structure is elucidated by X-ray. I'll now show you some details in the structure section of Uniprot which are useful to know if you wanted to ask such a Sparkle query, but which are definitely also useful to know about as an interactive user of Uniprot. For each experimental 3D structure associated with the Uniprot record, we can find the experimental technique or method that was used to obtain the structure. It can be X-ray or NMR. Another important detail to note is that experimentally determined 3D structures often do not cover the entire protein sequence, and Uniprot lists the position of the protein sequence covered by the 3D structure. Transmembrane proteins are difficult to crystallize because they are hydrophobic, so this is an interesting question to ask. Next topic is disease and variants. About 6,500 human genetic diseases are described in Uniprot, as well as the variations which are associated with the disease or which cause the disease. There is a note in the entry which tells us about the role of the gene towards the disease. To find all human enzymes involved in a genetic disease, we use now our well-known query in the advanced search and add an extra constraint called disease. Remember the extra set of parentheses I mentioned that we need to add back, back in to group the EC number and catalytic activity constraint. We find that more than a third of human enzymes are involved in a genetic disease. The last annotation topic we're looking at before moving on to Sparkle is post-translational modifications. Over 700 post-translational modifications, or PTMs, are currently annotated in Uniprot, and they follow the controlled vocabulary. We can look for human enzymes with a methyl arginine and use, again, the query that we know so well and add a constraint for modified residue, again, with the advanced search. 104 entries are returned, and the default table of results contains the standard columns, protein and gene names, organism and length, 
but by clicking on customize display we can add additional columns and we see that a large number of such columns are available here we've added one for modified residue which allows us to see all the sites where the methyl arginine can be found if you want to share the url of such a customized table of results with one of your colleagues if you want to particularly show them the columns that you have just added you can click on share and then on copy link to your results at the top and you will get a url which you can actually understand if you try and that will allow your colleagues to see exactly the same view of the results as you had Now, if we look back at what we've seen over the last 30 minutes or so, we got some insight into the different places where you can find enzyme-related content, from protein sequences to names and taxonomy, and all the functional annotation topics, CD structure, subcellular location, and diseases. So we've come to the end of the first section of this webinar. And before I hand over to Yevin, I'd like to encourage you to contact us with any questions you might have. And you can, of course, also contact us with bug reports, general feedback, or annotation updates. The contact form is available via the envelope symbol at the top of the page. And you'll also find there a link to the Help Center where you can find a wealth of useful documents. The Rio database and the Enzyme also have similar contact forms, so really use them to get in touch. And now I'll hand over to Yevin. Hello, so I will be talking a little bit about Sparkle. And Sparkle is a query language used to retrieve data stored in RDF. RDF is a knowledge representation, not just a data format. So the quick overview. Search, use natural language or keywords. You're not always so sure what you will find. And there's not much of a specification as in a formal standard body. There's the help pages and they'll tell you what, what was gonna happen. But however, all the search engines are limited by the provider's imagination. In your search is made as good as we can make it, but it's answering the questions that we think you'll ask. Sparkle is a little bit opposite. It's very precise. It has a formal query language, which is like SQL or Cypher. And you can run it internally because you can copy all the data. And it's completely limited by your own imagination. So what is RDF? RDF is talking about data in the world, simple sentences, subject, predicate, object, just three words. A subject by me, I, predicate, love, an object, in your product. However, in RDF, you don't use words, you use IRIs to represent the concepts, URLs. So the concept of P45850, a Uniport record, as an enzyme, as an object, EC classification would be represented by these long IRIs. So why do we have these long IRIs? Well, one of the problems is, and we always need to evaluate, we have lots of identifiers in all these different databases. For example, the number 993, can be a PubMed identifier, NCBI gene, or something in taxonomy. We never know as a programmer when we get a number like that, what is it that you actually meant? You add an IRI, it becomes obvious because there's context. What's nice is we can put it into our browser window and say, click on the link and we see what you were talking about. This also matches very nicely the FAIR principles because using global unique identifiers is FAIR principle number one. So using IRIs allows us to meet that. So how do we go from RDF to Sparkle? Well, you basically replace one or more of these SPO parts, subject, predicate, object parts, with something that has a question mark in front, and then the Sparkle engine will go into the database and find all the words, all the sentences, where that word can be replaced. So then you ask what word you want. So here is the query. We have select this is the thing i want everyone where everyone loves uniprot that's it however that's rather long to write so like in a good paper first use you can introduce abbreviations 
and in Sparkle, you write these at the top. So this is prefix is basically an abbreviation. So introduce abbreviation dictionary, which basically means that this HTTPS where the www.dictionary.com browse and the word love need to be concatenated, make your query simpler. And we use these a lot to help us read these queries. We have quite a large number of example queries that you can use to figure out new things and uh, let you be inspired about what you can do with Sparkle and what you can find in Iniprot that you wouldn't be able to find with just a search query. So most of these examples are not about enzymes. So I'll just show you how we can change all the examples which are not yet about enzymes into ones about enzymes. So this is example number five. It's just asking for Iniprot records, give me the ones which have a cross references to the PDB, the protein data bank, or 3D structures of proteins database. Then we add this new stanza at the bottom, which is the two parts, which are now a bit old, but in union. We say that either protein has to be classified with the EC classification. That's the first part, protein up colon enzyme question mark EC, or the inclusive or the proteins which have an catalytic activity annotation. So when would you use Sparkle? Is when you want to find enzymes with a trillion as an active site. So you can find enzymes and you can query for active sites, but you can't really easily ask with our search engine for specific amino acids. So when you get the PDF, these will be links and it will show you the query. Or a question like enzymes with metagenesis that targets the active site. Sometimes we want to ask about um, annotations and not about proteins. So here we have the examples from earlier in the talk, the enzymes which are um, derived from translation of at least two or more mRNAs. This kind of count queries we cannot do on search. You need the generalized query language for it. The other one was enzymes which contain at least two transmembrane domains whose 3D structure is associated with X-ray analysis. You need to know multiple things about the 3D structure and transmembrane domains and that it's an enzyme and look at the same way, again, combining data that was not thought of when we designed the search engine. Some of these questions can be quite complicated, even on a biological level. For example, this is a question that we received at biostars.org, where a person is looking to make a database and uh, is trying to couple this with information in Iniprot. And then it asks for some concepts called the catalytic triad that actually none of us here in the room knew beforehand. But with the Sparkle query, we can get very close to an answer that almost gives exactly what the user wants, only limited by the data, not by what our search engine was designed to do. Sometimes you might want to query not to find back interprot entries, but diseases or mutations or anything else that you might imagine. So the first example is given the list of human diseases associated with enzymes located in the mitochondria. Again, combining multiple facets in a way that wasn't originally designed. The second one is even more complicated on the data level because we are looking at diseases related to an entry where there's a mutation in the enzymes active site where that mutation is known to be related to a disease, not the general enzyme. Sometimes you want to access external databases. Inubrot KD has extra links to 180 other resources, but you might want to use your database, for example, a very small one, to combine with Inubrot on demand. There's something in Sparkle that allows that that is not possible in any other technology. I'll show you a little bit more examples. So for example, the enzyme tracking molecule similar to dopamine. Well, Inubrot is not very good at chemistry at least not so good that we can do chemical similarity searches. We use a tool called SASHEM, which is also Sparkle endpoint, to combine these two to give an answer to these questions. And that then expands into more complicated ones where we always use other people's data, including with Iniprot, to give a better answer. So 
What does that look like? In Sparkle, you have something called the service clauses. These are a way to ask database A to include database B as if there was a database A plus B that existed to answer your query. This doesn't depend on us at Inuprot knowing about database B or even approving it. As long as it's also Sparkle Engine and it's available on the public internet, you as a user decides if you want to use database B. That might just be something running on your laptop locally. So nice thing about Sparkle is that you have lots of Sparkle endpoints. In the CISP Institute of Bioinformatics, we have more Sparkle endpoints and you can find them up to date list always with this query. This is not just us and not just the SIB who provides Sparkle endpoints. There's many more. And for example, a nice site which ranks them is called Yummy Data. And this is specialized on the life sciences and biochemistry. And we use these to do all kinds of interesting queries, combining Iniprot in ways that we never imagined possible. Now, I'm going to go through an example in a little bit more details. Query is find genes encoding enzymes, catalyzing reactions, the metabolites of those, and the potential drugs acting on them. So there's a number of concepts there. Genes, not in your product proteins, but the genes encoding them. We are reactions, encoding them, uh, catalyzing the, sorry. Proteins, which are enzymes, the catalytic reactions, the metabolites that these reactions act on, and drugs acting on them. So this combines a lot of different data. Not all of these is available in your product. So let me go through the Sparkle query. So we first ask Iniprot for the disease link. So Iniprot has very high quality of disease annotations. So we ask protein, give me the disease annotation. The disease annotation has a disease associated with it. When you see these queries, you'll see semicolons and uh, commas. I won't go too much in details, but basically comma repeats the subject and predicate and semicolon replicates only the subject. So it makes the queries a little bit shorter. We also wanted to cataclysm activation and this catalyzed reaction has to go to RIA. RIA, we wanted to find the metabolites. We want to look up the cabbies there. So we no longer are only talking about in your product database. We're already talking about database in your product plus database RIA. Then we wanted to use the Iniprot cross-references to Ensemble, for example, to give the genes. And last not but least, we need to find the drugs. So we use a data set called Campbell, hosted in this case at the IDSM um, check, uh, check node of Elixir, where we're looking for a drug which is related to these proteins. This makes a big query combining many different concepts. Some parts of these come from Iniprot, some parts of the answer comes from RIA, and some parts come of the Elixir node of Czech Republic. And all combined, it does take a while, you get an answer combining protein diseases, reactions, metabolites, the drugs, and the DNA, all in one answer, where many of these concepts are not even available in Iniprot and are attached to an Iniprot database on the fly. So you see that things can be connected between the gene, the protein, the disease, the reaction, metabolites, and drugs, all nicely connected. At this point, I would like to remind you that it's not just us who do Iniprot. We have a wonderful team across our three sites who make Iniprot possible and um, give the data that you need to do wonderful life science work. So, thank you for your attention. And at this point, I'd like to, again, thank the SIB training team for making this possible. And we are waiting for your questions.